Hear the word of God. When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you that's the only reward they'll, you'll, they'll get. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as done, it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the wrongs we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Let us pray. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. Enlighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, we pray, in the name of your beloved. Amen. I have to confess that I am enamored with the eloquent speeches of others. And I also have to confess that I am flattered when other people think that my speech is eloquent. The speakers I heard at my continuing education this uh, a week ago, ending last Sunday, um, were eloquent, were articulate, were insightful, were captivating. For example, Friday notes key, Friday's keynote speaker, Ibu Patel, who is the founder and director of an interfaith youth corps in, based out of Chicago, but spread across campuses across the nation. Um, he spoke without notes. He gave a stirring oration that held the attention of everyone, including his seven and 10 year old sons who were sitting right in front of me for the whole hour and a quarter presentation. It was amazing. This man has not only major speaking skills, he has major parenting skills. I want to have equally impressive oration skills. I want to speak like Ibu Patel, or editor Dahlia Lithwick from Slate, or Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, all speakers I had the privilege of hearing a week ago at Chautauqua. The problem is, I don't want to have work for such great oration skills. I want, I want them to just kind of come to me, uh, appear to me out of the sky, however they come. They just, you know, bam, I'm immediately eloquent and can say all the right things at all the right times. I want to be able to say things so that people who hear my words will sit in their chairs and lean back and say, whoa. I come by this eloquence envy naturally. My mother taught several Sunday school classes about prayer. She studied it, she analyzed it, she uh, practiced it, and yet when I asked her how to create prayers, she, she suggested that I read books of prayers of the great prayers over history. Those who have had books of their prayers published, and in their words, find inspiration to, for my prayer. To be fair, she was counseling, counseling me on how to craft liturgical prayers, prayers for the people, prayers that I pray in front of others during a worship service. And when I was leading worship prayers or liturgical prayers, she wanted me to choose my words carefully, honoring the gift of time that those in worship were giving me. For example, if I were to pray a one-minute prayer in front of the presence of 75 people, I better have a prayer that is worthy of the gift of time that those 75 people are giving me, namely a 75-minute worth prayer in one minute. I need to honor that they were giving me this time to lead them before the throne of God. 
I still read the great prayers of, of history at times when I'm preparing for the morning prayer. I rarely use their words verbatim, but if I do, I tell you. But in times when I can't come up with the words from the own depths of my heart, I turn to the experts to loosen the circuits of my frozen brain. This striving for excellence, this paradigm that I have to pray in a way that wows others, that is worthy of the time that others are giving me, all this striving has at times gotten in the way of my personal prayer. Without even thinking about it, I have believed that I have to pray just the right way with, with all the these and the thous that I was raised with. And I think that I have to raise such a lofty prayer in an eloquent manner so that even God cannot turn away. As if addressing this attitude, the writer of Matthew says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them because God knows what you need before you ask. God knows what you need before you ask. So when you pray, you really don't need to say anything, at least not for God's benefit. When you pray, you only need to use the words that come to you in a normal conversation with any person you might encounter on the street. When you pray, you can talk to God as you would anyone else because God knows our needs even before we ask. God knows thoroughly what we are going through. God knows everything about us. So we don't need to come up with eloquence or ver verbosity to get God's attention. And we don't need to worry about wasting God's time and trying to say it right because God has all the time in the world. Literally. God has all the time in the world. And God can even hear the cries of our hearts, the concerns of our hearts that we haven't even articulated to ourselves. Monday evening, my son asked me about my week at Chautauqua, and I started talking about the highlights of my week. And as I talked, I kept remembering things, and I kept showing him all the pictures on my phone, and I, I showed him all 59 pictures and videos that I took <laughs> during the week. But it was okay, because he was an appreciative audience. He wanted to hear what happened. I can't stop talking about things that I'm excited about, that, that stir my soul. I can't stop talking about them, especially when I'm talking to an appreciative audience. God is an appreciative audience. God loves you more than anything else in the world, and the, the best thing about that is that's true of everybody. God loves each one of us so much that God appreciates hearing from us. God wants to hear everything we have to say, the good, the bad, everything. God knows everything we're going through already, so sometimes we just need the courage to say to God what God already knows. Not to bring God in on the secret, but so that we can be honest with ourselves before God and strip away any pretense that we're getting away with anything or that what happens to us in private is ours alone. God listens to us as an appreciative audience, as a friend. In John 15, we read, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. I don't call you servants any longer. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from God, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. To think that the creator of the universe, the holy God of all creation, the one who made the stars and the heavens, sent us Jesus who says he wants to call us friends, it blows the mind. God is as vast as the heavens, yet as personal as our best friend. When I was growing up, I would walk home, I would walk to school and home from school with, with my neighbor around the, the corner, five doors down from my house. And uh, we would walk to school and from school and talk together. And we'd play after school and all that kind of stuff. And one day, my best friend, my, my friend, was talking to me about <clears throat> um, how she was inviting her best friend over for a sleepover. 
and how they were going to do all sorts of exciting things like paint their nails and they were going to have a great time and she was just going on and on about this best friend and I kind of tuned out after a while because I thought I thought I was the best friend that she could have hope for <laughs> I thought I was her best friend and and though we never used that language I thought well she's the one I spend the most time with in my little elementary life and and she's my neighbor and we play together all the time and if she's not my best friend then I guess I missed the best friend bus I have no best friend because I thought she was my best friend God calls each of us best friend we are each God's BFF best friend forever What's even better than realizing that we are God's BFF is the realization that God initiates this relationship with us. We are chosen. We are loved. We are the apple of God's eye. We don't have to do anything to achieve this because God truly wants to be our best friend. If you could talk with God as your best friend, what would you say? What thing that God already knows about you would you like to work out with God? Anne Lamott, author of the book, Help, Thanks, Wow, says that these three prayers, help, thanks, and wow, cover all that we need to cover in our prayer life with God. What do you have to say to God today? Help me? Thank you? Wow? Perhaps those of you on Facebook have noticed a growing trend among your friends, as I have noticed among mine, the majority of my friends are no longer posting pictures of themselves or their food. I'm, I'm glad to not see their food anymore, but I miss the pictures of them and their surroundings and their friends and all that sort of thing. Many of my Facebook friends are now posting links to articles about this or that thing. And so there's a link to this thing and there's a link to that thing. And I've been looking at many of these links that they post and posting some of them myself, I admit, there are sometimes I read somebody else's link and say, wow, and so then go to the page and post the link on my Facebook page. But I'm noticing recently that I'm less and less interested in what others say or what others have written in articles. Facebook is called social media because it's social. Jeremy's really good on Facebook. He's very social. <laughs> he posts pictures about himself and this is great and have you ever thought about this kind of car? Yeah. Anyway, um, the, the Facebook posts that are, up, that are you are social. And sometimes the fa Facebook posts that you post of links are political. And it's not called political media. Though I appreciate the post, what I really want to know is what's going on with you. Just as if, if you and I were having a face-to-face -face conversation and you were to, to go to the nesting grounds, but, um, I could just picture some of you actually doing this, but um, when we go to the nesting grounds and talk or come to the office or talk after worship, you know, I don't expect you to bring an article from the newspaper or a blurb from a magazine and base our entire conversation on what is in the article in the newspaper or in the blurb. That's only happened to me once, and now watch, all, all of you are going to bring it. Did you see this article? Yeah, no, don't. That conversation that we have with one another is supposed to be do, can, making the connection stronger between us and not pointing to the more eloquent words that we think uh, somebody else is saying that is being said on our behalf. I, do, I noticed the irony of this because the next thing I wanted to do was quote an article, but it's not my whole sermon, okay? Jeremy, Jeremy Steele wrote in the, the re most recent issue of Interpreter Magazine, it's a United Methodist magazine, he says, social media is about sharing your life. Unless we pay attention, our presence on social media can, come from a, can, can make a quick turn from sharing our life to merely posting links to news articles. Often articles can be offensive to our social media connections. When we share a polarizing article, these platforms that are meant to connect us turn into tools that divide us. Most of that completely disappears when we choose to share what is happening in our life rather than posting endless streams of news links. Prayer, like social media, is meant to share your heart and your life with God. 
Prayer is talking to the creator of the universe, the one who not only created all that is and all that was and all that shall be, but wants to be our best friend forever. I find it comforting to read in the Bible that I'm not the only one who is learning about prayer and growing in my prayer life. In Luke's version of today's uh, scripture, in Luke chapter 11, they have the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. That's the version of the Lord's Prayer that I'm more familiar with. It's in Luke. And in, and in Luke, so the disciples, Jesus' closest friends, are saying, uh, Jesus, teach us how to pray. There's something about the disciples admitting they need help with prayer that makes me feel a little less embarrassed that I, too, need help with prayer. Next week, as we continue our discussion on prayer, we'll discuss about what to pray as we focus today mainly on how we pray. We'll talk more about what God wants to hear from us. How shall we pray? First, we use our own words, our own plain, simple words, and second, we speak from the heart, knowing that God will give us all the time in the world, that God wants to be our friend. At the end of my sermon, I often uh, close with prayer, and um, I will in a minute, but because we're talking about prayer, it makes sense for you guys to pray. So uh, in 30 seconds or so, we're going to bow in prayer, and there'll be a time for you in silent prayer to just share with God silently the things that are on your heart. It may be thank you. It may be help, help, help. It may be wow, it may be something else, but I just want you to take some time now to pray to God the things that are on your heart. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer at any time, that we can pray the prayers of our hearts and you know our needs even before we ask. Thank you for your companionship on the journey every step of the way. Thank you that you never abandon us, always travel with us. Thank you that we can call you best friend. Help us in our times of struggle. Help us to know that you are holding us in the palm of your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.